Hi, it's Bryn from Arabian Armory, and today we're finally ready to talk about Vikings. So we're starting off with the rise of the Viking era, and that would be roughly the 8th century. So it'd be post-Carolingian and Merovingian, definitely post-fall of Rome. Um, what you'll start to see is the evolution of the sword, in particular. That, that For some reason, archaeologically, that's, that's what we're going off of a lot. Um, and I have an example right here. So this sword in particular, I'm going to use the term svard. Svard is just a Scandinavian translation of sword. Um, the Vikings didn't really bother to have like a, sp a fancy special name for their sword, so it just makes it easier to clarify. So typically a svard was between 31 to 41 inches. Uh, this one in particular is about 3 feet, 36 inches. Um, the pommel on this one has five lobes. Sometimes they had three lobes, sometimes they had a walnut shape. Uh, there's just a variety of shapes on the pommel. And then they have that uh, smiley face, upwards shaped guard. Uh, not all of them had fullers. This one in particular does have fullers. When they did have fullers, they were rather wide. Uh, aesthetically, I find it very, very satisfying. You'll especially notice is the width at the tip. So what I'm going to talk about uh, getting rid of some misconceptions about Viking swords and comparing it to a medieval arming sword. So you'll notice that the Viking sword has literally twice as wide of a tip. Now what you'll see in a lot of cheap reproductions of a Viking sword is that they don't bother to give it a distal taper. And you can't really do a profile taper because profile tapers, well, they existed in the Viking era for swords. They're not nearly as pronounced as what you just saw in the arming sword for the later medieval period. So to get the correct feel for what a Viking sword should be like, if you include a distal taper like this one does, you'll have a very different weight and very different balance. Just in front of the guard, I'm getting a thickness of 4.7 millimeters. If we go towards the middle of the blade, that comes down to... Oh, starting to catch inside the uh, fuller there. Oops. That comes down to 4. Let's go up here. That's a 3.8, and at the very tip, 3.65. And back down here again, this comparison, uh, roughly 5. So, a little bit under 5, actually. 4.8 or so. Now, 4.8 here to 3.8 or so at the tip, maybe 3.6. That's a reasonable amount of distal taper. And so obviously the balance point is going to be closer to the hand than if it didn't have that. Uh, any cheap sword, it's just one bar stock of steel, and they just kind of throw edges on it and call it a day. Now I won't deny that if you didn't have a taper on it, that the sword would then cut better because it has more mass, especially because it has more mass towards the tip. Uh, but the way that the Viking Svard is designed, it has enough mass in its tip because of its width, that you really don't need to make it overly thick. Uh, what I will say though, is that it does have a slightly heavier blade than later medieval designs, some of them, distinction. Uh, and because of that, the balance point is gonna be a little bit closer to the tip. Uh, this one in particular is roughly six, five and a half, five and a half inches, something like that. Uh, you will see really bad reproductions have eight and nine inch balance points and I'm not saying that that never happened in the, the, the historical period certainly you might find one or two examples that, that were balanced like that but when you see that the vast majority of blades are balanced a certain way and designed a certain way they're constructed with that that ideal for a reason you need a weapon to perform and if it's too clunky to perform at its task then it's gonna get you killed so this is Svard I mentioned how the tip is twice as wide as the arming sword that I had in comparison now, this spatulated tip, that's what I called it, uh, the, that's the correct term for a wide tip like that, is very good for maintaining cutting power in that last section of the blade, the last quarter or so. Tremendously more so than a narrow blade. Uh, there's obviously that small difference in the way that the weapon is going to be used. Uh, one of the downsides to having a wide tip like this is the armor of the period, predominantly chainmail. You're going to have a lot of trouble trying to get a wide tip through chainmail because you're going to be fighting a large amount of bunched up rings. 
If you compare that to a narrow tip, like on the arming sword that I was just showing you guys, a tip on this, you only have to fight a couple rings. So this actually would pierce through. Uh, getting rid of a related myth about chainmail being worthless against thrusting, bear in mind, one, most chainmail that you'll see on, online is just not historical and it's crap. Uh, so this, this is riveted. Specifically, this is riveted carbon steel. So if you compare that to butted, which is often made from uh, chicken wire and related things, you can get a bunch of, of coils of wire from like a Home Depot or Menards or Lowe's. So the trouble with that is wire steel is engineered to be soft on purpose so that you can bend it and ply it with your hands or with pliers. Carbon steel that's used in proper chain mail like this, it's not supposed to be soft. If you can spring temper it or harden it or quench it, that you want to do that. Now, that's not to say that the Viking period had lots of uh, quenched, hardened chainmail. Uh, there were plenty of cases of just regular iron that you couldn't harden because there's no carbon content. Uh, but if you had the opportunity and you had the money, you would do it. Now, the riveting that I mentioned before, that's super important for the structural integrity of the mail and understanding how it performs, not just protecting you, but especially protecting you in the context of weapons of its era. Uh, the rivet is what prevents the ring from wanting to burst open. If you compare that to butted costume mail, you can literally pull costume mail apart with your hands. If I grabbed the collar and this was butted and I just pulled it really hard, I would literally rip it. But this is riveted carbon steel, that's not going to happen. So that's, that's an unfair uh, bad rap that chain mail tends to get uh, about being worthless against thrusting. No, it, it, it's this was when this was the predominant armor of its time, perfectly fine against wide tipped swords. Obviously, with spears, you can get uh, a couple spears that have a narrower point, and that would definitely be a, a very good weapon to use against mail, and spears were popular for centuries upon centuries worldwide, so... Yeah, spears are going to give you a bad time. Simultaneously, however, it's a polearm. Polearms are going to give any kind of armor a bad time. Polearms are, are going to thrust with enough force that even if they skate off, if they find a gap when they skate, they're going to hit you. It's going to hurt. So other things about the sword before I move on... Um, this one in particular actually has a slightly uh, larger than normal handle. So in our modern uh, eyes, in our modern sensibilities, this the handle doesn't look particularly long. If anything, most people would say that's perfectly fine. It's ideal. It comfortably fits my hand, and I have a, like maybe an extra half or quarter inch past the bottom of my palm, so I can slide my hand a little bit, and I don't feel like I'm getting cramped. Now, Viking swords that we found archaeologically have a very, very tight fit on the handle. Ones that I literally would not be able to move my hand at all up or down. Why is that? So, some speculate that what you're supposed to do with a Viking sword, when they have that tight configuration on the handle, is what's called a casting blow, where you kind of slightly release your hand as you pivot the blade and you swing it. And maybe there is some truth to that. I come from a perspective that's mixing Eastern and Western martial arts. Uh, grew up like that. And so, I suspect maybe, to some degree, there's actually something else going on. When you look at Indian swords, Turkish swords, Arabian swords, Arabian armory, and you have swords, scimitars, and, and tulwars, and similar weapons, some of which have that tight configuration on the hilt that you can barely fit your hand on there, but you can fit it, what you're doing is called a draw cut. So the way that you're supposed to fight with these kind of curved swords, even though this is a straight sword, is that you're supposed to draw the edge along the target as you're slicing, and that makes the cut significantly deeper. Maybe the reason why the hilt is so tight on most Viking swords, not this one, is because while you are intended to chop with it, it is also encouraging you to then draw the blade out and slice after your chop. It's hard to say for certain. There's not a lot of written records uh, explicitly stating that this is how a Viking must hold his sword this way and maneuver his footwork like this. Uh, manuscripts illustrating technique don't really come around until later on in the medieval period and especially in the Renaissance. But this is just an interpretation to be considered. So moving on to the chainmail, what you'll notice about this chainmail is that when I extend my chest out and when I pull it in, that the mesh kind of opens and closes. Now, it's important thing about making correct chainmail, on top of having the carbon steel, on top of being riveted, is you have to have the grain in the correct direction. So the grain 
opens up than when my fingers open up. This means that when I breathe in, the chainmail isn't fighting me as I do that. When the grain's going this way, as opposed to the way that it is right now, that means that the chest can't expand when I breathe in. And so you have to compensate by making it even bigger. Proper chainmail you want to be fitted to you as much as possible. Now I want that to have the caveat that, in the Viking era, chainmail wasn't necessarily fitted to the person. Many times it was scrapped from a warrior that had passed away, or inherited to you by a relative. And so, chainmail, luckily enough, has, has that good enough fit. This one in particular that I've been fighting in for a while now, you'll notice that it has a little bit of an expansion going on for uh, by my armpit. And you want to have that, that upside down triangle shape where it gets a little bit narrower by your waist, it's a little bit wider by your shoulders, so that it has the right feel when you pull and push, when you rise your arm to raise your sword or raise your shield. You don't want it to be baggy. Bagginess in some cases can actually hinder your movement more than if it was fitted closely. On top of that, baggy armor is just extra weight for nothing. I'm not super big on the wrist circumference. I'm probably going to be altering that with more tapering. But we can definitely see, if I scoot out, is that I do have a stepped taper going on, where it's narrowest here, and then it gets a little bit wider, a little bit wider, a little bit wider until it gets to the armpit. Very important to have that. Other things about uh, good chainmail that it's supposed to have a little bit of expansion in the elbow to fit the point of your elbow when your arm is closed. If the sleeve is wide enough, it doesn't need that. This one doesn't have a pocket because it's wide enough. Uh, but that is a, an important part of making good mail. Now, caveat for the Viking period specifically, while they did have armor like this, the difference is they didn't have a full sleeve. So it would stop maybe a little bit before the elbow, or in some cases more like a t-shirt. But that doesn't mean that their arms were exposed. Warriors in the Viking era, of various cultures, not just Scandinavian, would be using round shields. So round shields, like this one, typically they were going to be between 24 and 36 inches, most commonly 30 to 36. Smallest ones, roughly 19, 20 inches. Biggest ones, about 41, 42 inches. And we have a shield like this that easily covers my elbow. So I don't need to worry about my elbow being exposed because it's just not exposed. Simultaneously, I have a sword in my other hand, so the sword itself can be used to defend. It's a very bad misconception to think that the sword was never used to, to defend yourself uh, from a, an attack by blocking, and that, oh, you'll, you'll ruin the edge of your sword, you would never do that. Well, obviously, one, you can block with the flat or the guard, um, although I would recommend not doing that, but what I would recommend, what's actually talked about in medieval and renaissance manuscripts is that when you perform a parry using your sword you push your edge into their flat so if i was to hit the flat of a sword with the edge of my sword because it's of a wider surface contact what's happening is that it's not going to bite into the sword versus edge on edge they definitely start to bite into each other now Let's say I'm in a situation where I just don't see this, this blow coming until it's too late and I just panic and block with the edge. I want everyone to consider that ultimately it's better to ruin your sword but be alive than to die but you have a perfectly intact sword. If my sword breaks on the battlefield and I'm in the medieval or dark age or wherever, I can find a new one off a dead body. I can buy one. I can go to a blacksmith and see if he can repair the one that I have. But I can't go to the arm store and buy a new arm if my arm's been removed by a very dirty blade. They're not going to be able to stitch it back on in the medieval period. They can try, maybe they would, and it would rot because the surgical implements aren't clean. So yeah, have the essence of, of common sense uh, with the sword. It's a tool, and it's better that the tool breaks and you live. Going more into the armor, uh, this one in particular you see that has brass. Now interesting question. Were things like bronze and brass used on the same shirt as iron? Decoratively, yes, in the medieval and renaissance period. But what we'll see in the Celtic uh, people that interacted with the Romans, what you see with the Romans, what you see with the, the Vikings, is that you can have mail that is brass or bronze coexist with mail that is iron or steel. Really, you have to use whatever materials you happen to have. So if you run out of iron, iron, uh, iron or steel are preferred, brass is perfectly fine. Use brass for the sleeves and 
for your torso, you can keep the, the iron or steel because that's the strongest. Technologically, though, if you have more uh, of an advanced kingdom or empire, you can afford more resources to be expended on this, you're going to want iron or steel almost exclusively with brass only being an accent piece. Uh, next we have lamellar. So this is a project that I was making years ago. Um, never really finished it. I'm probably going to take it apart and do something else with it. That didn't really like how it came out. But what lamellar is, is it's lots of small plates that you then lace together. Plates can be iron or steel. Sometimes they were made of rawhide. Um, there are other materials that have been used in different cultures. What the Japanese sometimes did, is they could actually get really thick leather, and they would lacquer it. And the lacquer that they used had powdered iron in it. So functionally, it was not as good as, as a proper iron plate for the lamellar plates, but it's close enough. Very interesting technology. Anyways, lamellar was found, and it was dated roughly 900 to 950 in Sweden. And so that leads to the speculation, lamellar was a thing for Vikings? Yes? No? One of the issues with the, the find is it's hard to tell if that was uh, armor that was made by a Scandinavian for a Scandinavian, or if it was brought by a mercenary, or if it was traded for. You don't have nearly as many archaeological finds of lamellar in uh, Sweden and Norway and Denmark compared to chainmail. Chainmail is abundantly more common. But that's not to say that Vikings had absolutely no access to lamellar. Certainly they would have access to lamellar for the ones that went to join the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantines had something called the Varangian Guard. And for centuries, Vikings just showed up. They were allowed to be the elite emperors chosen and they fought for the, the Christian kingdom. They weren't required to convert. They could keep their own religion. And the reason why the Vikings were doing this is gold and glory. And the reason why the emperor of, of uh, Byzantium was doing this, that would be the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, is because the Viking is not going to care about other royal families. They're not going to care that, oh, this guy says that his uncle or his cousin or his nephew is supposed to be the real emperor, so help us usurp the current one. And No, they don't, that doesn't mean anything. They can't be bought in that way. So they're therefore more reliable because they have no personal ties to any of the other uh, people that might be competing to become the new emperor. Um, there are plenty of battles that the Varangian Guard took place. Uh, so in particular, you can look at the Battle of Pelagonia, um, Cherimini, the Siege of Iconium, Beroia, uh, Monte Perosa, I think that's the other one called. They were in a lot of battles. It's particularly, we're going to talk about Harald Hardrada. So, Harald Hardrada was a Viking king, actually. Um, but aside from the king thing, because he had a lot of stuff going on in his life. For a long time, he was in the Varangian Guard. So, Vikings, him and the people that he brought with him, and many other that became conscripted before and after, they fought in places like Italy, or Turkey, or the Mediterranean Sea. They went very far out. They had contact with Africans. They had contact with Arabs. They had contact with Persians. They had contact with, potentially, even Chinese people that were there on trade. This idea that, that Vikings had a very narrow view of the world because they had no contact with other races is just silly. No. I just named different cultures that Harald Hardrada not only met, but either did trade with or fought. Hardrada, in particular was responsible for the capture of 80 Arab forts. He was also responsible for uh, stopping the Bulgarian uprising uh, because the Bulgarians wanted to be independent from the Byzantine Empire. So certainly they have access to a lot of outside technology and outside culture, which means that's the example that I mentioned before. They have access to lamellar in that context. Um, other things about the Vikings... So I mentioned the shields before. A big misconception, Skyrim is pretty big responsibility, but movies did it too, is the idea that rawhide is not the rim, that somehow steel or iron are the rim. Using iron or steel would definitely be more durable material on the rim for a shield, but we don't find a lot of archaeological examples of that. Now obviously you can say that rawhide and leather are going to rot over time compared to iron, um, but even with that, iron still isn't found, curiously enough. 
not nearly on the same level as tiny scraps or remnants of leather or rawhide on preserved shields. Now, it's more economical, because the common Viking who isn't a, a Jarl or a Thane or a Housegarl, they can afford leather or rawhide more than they can afford a giant band of iron. But yeah, that's how the shield was rimmed. The thickness of the shield, and this one in particular, is 3 eighths inch. So half inch and under is typically what they would go for. What you sometimes saw is that the center of the shield would be thick, and then it would have a taper to a thinner edge. That obviously alters the weight and balance, but still retains enough strength where it really matters. This one doesn't have any iron bands on the sides to support it, because it's made out of plywood, it doesn't need it. But obviously a shield in that time period that's made of separate planks, you would want some kind of iron bands, or at least wooden supports on it, to help bind them a little bit better. What you notice about this shield is that I've laminated it in the front and back with uh, canvas, a very dense weave of canvas. Now, the reason why you would want to laminate your shield, I've mentioned it before, is that it holds the wood uh, a little bit tighter, so that the fibers don't splinter off if your sword or if your shield ever gets hit by a sword or an axe. It's very important that it has that. So this one in particular is unpainted. However, there's plenty of depictions of Viking shields being painted in spirals or swirls or a checkered pattern. There's also some uh, examples that are discussed saying that they had certain poems or or um, sagas written on the shield. Something that inspired the warrior on a personal level. Um, there's nothing wrong with a shield that is center gripped, which is what the Viking shields typically were. A lot of people suggest that, oh, well, it's an inferior technology to a strap because it's not structurally supported by your bones the way an arm strap one was, so you have to exert more of your muscular strength over time, which will wear you out. Now, I will grant you, this is less stable than a strap shield. And yes, you have to use more muscle to maintain its position, which means that you'll have to fight off wanting to just kind of drop it. But the advantage of being able to turn the shield is actually a good one. What you can do is you can bait someone to hit you on the inside of the, the shield. And when the shield turns over, you can actually push their blade away, or the sword away on that side, and then come around from behind over your own arm and blow the, to the head with your sword. Also take into consideration that a shield that's held uh, in a punch grip like this as opposed to strap, your arm is further away from the wood, which means if the shield were to suddenly fail because it just took one too many blows and started falling apart, your arm isn't immediately going to get broken or cut in half. Your arm is behind your hand, which is behind this steel boss in the center. One last thing to consider is that when you have a center grip shield, you have a lot of reach in front of your hand. So if you ever want to punch someone with a shield, which definitely that is a very good strategy, that extra reach, I have like two feet of reach on top of my fist, essentially, because this shield's a little bit more than two feet wide. So that's a lot to hit someone with. And obviously the mass of the shield is going to contribute a lot to its impact. So yeah, center grip Viking shields, they were made like that for a reason, there's nothing wrong with them, and if they didn't perform well, they wouldn't have been made that way. They would have been replaced. Other uh, examples of uh, Viking armor include helmets, right? So that includes the nasal helm, which... Oops. Anyways, that includes the nasal helm, which does not have horns on it. Uh, operas seem to have popularized the idea that they had horns, but horned helmets were really more of a thing in the Bronze Era for Europe. Although you did see helmets in Japan that sometimes had horns on them, animal horns. Um, but yeah, that's not a thing that happened with Vikings. So the nasal helm, sometimes it was round at the top. Sometimes it was pointed, like a bullet point at the top. And it did good enough at protecting your head. People often have a concern of, well, your face is mostly exposed, say for a small bar of steel on your nose. Why would anyone want a helmet that didn't cover their entire head? Well, one, economical, it's straightforward. It's easier to give lots of people half helmets than to give a couple of people full helmets and everyone else has nothing. But two, even if you could do that, you might not necessarily want to. What you'll notice about a helmet that only covers half of your head, namely the cranium and part of the face, is that it's protecting your brain, which is really the most important part. But you have excellent hearing, you have excellent breathing. Being able to breathe is incredibly important in combat. 
If you run out of air, you're as good as dead. Being able to hear is also important. Maybe you need to retreat. Maybe you need to flank on the right side. Maybe someone's about to flank you. Knowing what's happening on the battlefield is very important. So, having a helmet that didn't cover your ears and didn't cover your mouth, those are pretty good things sometimes. Another thing to consider about the helmet and the way that people fought is that you can always tuck your chin and have blows come for the helmet as opposed to come for your face. So yeah, the uh, intimidating, like, anger look like this. You can always do that if you're wearing that kind of helmet, and you're perfectly fine. Um, however, you do see, as time progresses, that people start to want more encompassing helms. So you get things like a Spangen helm, where they have a sort of spectacles of steel over the eyes, over the cheekbones. And then the sometimes had hinged plates over the sides to protect the sides of the head. One example of uh, Spangen Helm style design is the Girmunbu Helm. Girmunbu is probably one of aesthetically my favorite helmets. So that's an example that you see the spectacle plating that covers around the eyes. Uh, it actually also has um, signs that an aventail was going to cover the back of the neck and the sides of the neck. Aventail being a curtain of chainmail. And then it had reinforcements across the sides and then the front and back of the helmet. So the extra bands, aesthetically, they look kind of interesting. But the reason why that's there is to increase the structure of the helmet for blows that come straight down on the head, while still maintaining a light enough weight that it's not going to be encumbering to the wearer. Uh, helmets like this would eventually go on to evolve into Crusader-style helmets. And certainly you saw in the early era of the Crusades, many of the swords, just like the armor, were actually very similar to what Vikings were using. You see archaeological finds, and also artistic depictions of uh, Crusader-era swords that are just as wide at the tip as a Viking sword. The main difference is that they start having more complex, not complex necessarily, but more developed guards, ones that extend a little bit further and cover more of your hand, uh, as opposed to this, which covers my knuckles, but just barely. Now, why did the Viking era end? It's a very good question. So you have the Battle of Stamford Bridge, and this features, same guy I mentioned before, Harold Hardrada. So what happened is, Edward the Confessor, he's, he's a king, that didn't have any kids. So then he dies. And there's a couple of different people who want to take his throne. Harold Hardrada wants the Vikings to claim the throne. He ends up uh, falling at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, uh, along with, I believe, Tyr? Is that his name? Uh, another Viking general that was with him. So then, it becomes a fight between Harold Godwinson and William, Duke of Normandy. This is a fight for the English throne. Uh, Godwinson ends up getting defeated by William, Duke of Normandy, and so Normans end up ruling an English throne. The interesting thing about that is while the predominantly Viking uh, culture people ended up losing, Harold Hardrada and his forces, the successor of the later battle, the Battle of Hastings, they're half Viking, essentially. Normans were Viking people that came to France, they settled there, they intermarried with French people, and started adopting French culture. A lot of them were half or a quarter or three-quarter Viking. So I think it's kind of interesting that they call the Battle of Stamford Bridge the end of the Viking era, when a battle three weeks later was won by very Viking people, or at least Viking-adjacent, ethnically at least. But the main point of, of historians saying that that was the end of the Viking era is talking about how claims to a throne by a purely Scandinavian people decreased tremendously. How the threat of impending Scandinavians, I, I prefer using that term to saying Viking over and over, um, the, the impending threat of them invading and taking your stuff goes away tremendously. That's thanks to the French being smart and realizing it's better to let them join you than let them kill you. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that happens with the Vikings, and they have a tremendous amount of influence on European history. Um, hopefully this has been informative, and if you have any other questions about armor, sh swords, shields, or any other aspects of the Viking period, feel free to ask. One last thing that uh, I'm going to mention is debates on whether Vikings wore gambesons, agatons, or equivalent um, padded garments for their armor. Now, certainly they'd have to wear some kind of thick clothing to survive the winter. And functionally, I would say, any kind of thick clothing that you wear 
would work decent enough as a substitute for a gambeson. I mean, right now I'm wearing a hoodie. Now, obviously, this is, if I'm getting into a real sword fight, this is not enough padding to cushion me, but it prevents the armor from chafing against my skin. And if I was trying to survive a Scandinavian winter where I don't have modern heating in my home, I don't have uh, a car that I can sit in and have the heat blasting, I'm going to have to survive somehow, so clothing would be significantly thicker. I compare it to, in particular, the Russian coats for the winter during the Second World War. There's lots of records talking about the Germans and Russians fighting in World War II, and bayonets were having trouble getting through Russian winter coats. And they weren't intended to be armor in the slightest. They were literally just winter coats. But they were so thick that they performed like they were armor. And that's my argument for the Vikings. I think that even if they didn't have something that they had some equivalent calling of gambeson, they didn't make it with the intention of this is padded armor, they had padded thick clothing that might as well have been a gambeson. That, for all intents and purposes, is just a gambeson in everything but name. But yeah, that's my perspective, and I'd like to hear yours. Have a good night.